Our voices. Our stories. Our community. Several groups in Sudbury have teamed up to explore the best ways to utilize Ramsey Lake. In particular, they're looking at developing a facility to host competitive water sports events. In 2013, the Federal Economic Development Initiative made an announcement that would impact thousands of residences in Sudbury and across the region. He's introduced by then mayor of Sudbury, Marianne Matichuk. Please welcome one of Greater Sudbury's favorite partners, the Honorable Minister Tony Clement. Pleased to announce Fedmore funding, totaling nearly $2.2 million uh, that will support uh, uh, three basic initiatives in the greater Sudbury region. Uh, of the total, the Northern Water Sports Centre uh, will receive a $1 million investment from our government to construct its new facility right here on the shores of Lake Ramsey. So let's give a big round. It's really exciting as this is going to be, it's going to put us further with the Water Sports Centre and the Water Sports Centre is going to be a great opportunity for sports tourism in our city. It's also an enormous event just from the perspective of the community. We've got everybody involved, right? The community is involved with the fundraising, the province is involved with the fundraising, the city is involved with the fundraising, now the federal government is involved too. That really shows the diversity of uh, places that we're pulling from for this facility. Not just for, for what it's going to mean for funding, but what it means for how this facility is going to be used. It's a local facility that will have a, a regional impact, a provincial impact, a global impact. We're already seeing that with the individual programs. We can build on those programs with this investment in a way that wouldn't be possible elsewhere. Dr. Thomas Merritt is an active board member of the Northern Water Sports Center and head coach for the Northern Water Sports Center Parasport Program. At about the same time that we were really developing and expanding the Parasport Program, the, the people that were, were running the programming for the Canoe Club, for the Dragon Boat Festival, for the Rowan Club, as, as a trio, those three sport groups started talking about the fact that each club or program was limited in, in what they could produce, what they, the programming that they could put forward by the space that we were in. The Canoe Club had operated as its own entity for over 100 years at that point, the rowing club since the early 90s. That conversation around a larger space expanding programming was happening at the same time that all of the partners were talking about accessibility. And we realized that these were just two aspects of exactly the same thing. We needed a bigger space. We needed an accessible space. I'm uh, Bob Humphrey. I'm one of the original founding board members of the Northern Water Sports Center. I've been involved since uh, about uh, 2006, um, almost right from the inception. I've been involved with the rowing club for 26 years. Uh, accessibility was always one of the number one concerns. Like you, it wasn't worth building if you couldn't make it accessible because um, as the population ages, as, as people have different disabilities, we didn't want to have anyone excluded from the project. Sheila Mendez was the project manager for the Northern Water Sports Center project from 2006 to 2015. My early connection was through my work with Nichols Yellow Eagle Boulanger Architects, who was retained to develop a feasibility study, looking at the feasibility of developing such a center through a partnership between the Sudbury Rowing Club, the Sudbury Canoe Club, and the Sudbury Dragon Boat Festival. So we were fortunate to secure significant support from both the federal government and the provincial government and that really provided the basis for us to approach the small business community and ask for their support and ask them to get behind this project and the pitch to them uh, had a lot to do with accessibility and their interest in the project had a lot to do with the fact that we were making significant investments and we're really demonstrating a commitment to accessibility and ensuring that people, regardless of their abilities, would be able to get out on the water and enjoy what was being developed here. The funding process would take place over 12 years and was not met without its challenges. This is about 2008, 2009. The economy is starting to take a slowdown. And one of the aspects of that was if any of us wanted to be able to fund our programming, we were going to be more successful as partners. And the federal funders, the provincial funders, the city came back and said, you know, what each of you are doing is, is fine. It's great. But if you can do this as a partnership, then we can build this together. And that synergy is going to allow us to, to fund more projects. And so I was going as a coach to these funding workshops about how do we fund para sport, how do we fund at this point para rowing. 
And one of the first messages was, in today's economic climate, if you want this to work, you have to be working as partners. There's just not enough money to fund this club or this club. But there is enough money that if these clubs are working together and you can show us how this is a legitimate partnership, that's the kind of thing that we could fund. The city of Greater Sudbury played a vital role in the success of the project. With the most fresh water lakes per capita anywhere in the world, Sudbury has quickly become a premier destination for athletes and tourists alike. And the municipality understands the importance of preserving accessible water sport in the community. Based on the demographics of Greater Sudbury, it's estimated that there are roughly 24,000 to 26,000 citizens living with disabilities. The initial pitch was to the city, and, and that was to get their support for uh, not only committing cash to the project, and they committed over a half a million dollars to this project, but the biggest uh, contribution to the project was in the way of this property, which is, you know, in Bell Park and part of a tremendous asset to this community. So for the city to entrust it to the partners to develop this project on it was a huge accomplishment. The city would go on to contribute in a variety of different ways. The city also helped out by allowing us to build that close to the water because um, otherwise um, the floodplain is, is about a meter higher than our, our bottom floor. So the building would have been higher, there would have been steep grades to the water and the accessibility would have been shot. They accommodate us that way and, and you know, that way accessibility played a key role in the look of the site and also the function of the site. We didn't retrofit. We didn't make the facility accessible. We didn't do what we had to do. The facility exists because the community of Greater Sudbury bought into the idea of access and accessibility. And they are a fundamental, that accessible sport pro program, those athletes that are part of the program are a fundamental reason why we're here today and why the buildings exist. That's really cool. And that's something, that sense of ownership and pride is something that we can give to every single member of that Parasport program. And I think that's a really unique thing. It, it gives you a different feel for your organization when you know you're not an afterthought, thought, you're not something that's been, you know, okay, here's a box that we have to check. This, this whole project was based on being accessible and the success of the project was based on that accessibility and our message to the community that we're based around accessibility. Our community will return after the break. We now return to our community. My name is Steve Daniel. I'm a family physician in Chelmsford, uh, Ontario. Uh, my connection to the Northern Water Sports Centre goes back uh, before the building uh, uh, stands today. Uh, I was introduced to water sport through um, my coach, Thomas Merritt, who I met uh, way back in 2006. I was in the, the forces for about uh, 12 years. I was a sergeant in uh, the 3rd Battalion Royal Canadian Regiment. My, um, my specialty was parachute operations. I was a jump master and a pathfinder, a free fall jump master. And at the time of my accident, I was on my military free fall parachute instructor course. So uh, it, was, it was a beautiful day, uh, much like today, you know, 30 degrees. Uh, I was on my second jump of the day. Uh, and uh, it was, it was uh, going off mainly without a hitch uh, up until my landing. And, um, you know, I'm not sure even to this day what happened it was uh, a zero wind day which is really hard to land when you're free fall parachuting because you have a forward velocity of about 40 50 kilometers an hour so you have to you know when know when to break and uh, there was a lot of choppy air coming in because of the heat and uh, i just came in too fast for my landing and uh, ended up burst fracturing uh, one of my one of my vertebrae on landing so i was uh, essentially paralyzed instantly on landing uh, you know, the moments uh, after, I remember vividly my friends, uh, you know, coming to help me, uh, them uh, calling the ambulance, getting me to the, the local hospital, and, uh, you know, it wasn't, it was uh, shortly thereafter I found out the bad news. I had fractured my vertebrae and damaged my spinal cord and uh, I would never walk again. So Mina and I had just started the program. I think at this point, um, Steve might have been the second athlete we put on the water. Dr. Thomas Merritt was the co-founder of the Adaptive Rowing Program, 
the first accessible water sport program in Sudbury, and the platform for what would later become the Northern Water Sports Center's Parasport program. He takes us through his journey with Stephen Daniel. Steve, at that point, was looking to find a sport as part of his rehab. So he'd been injured a few years before that. Um, he was to the point, to sort of physically and psychologically, where he wanted to embrace a sport and go forward. He and I went out, rode in a double a couple of times. We got some rowing machine times. Um, and then we had a, a national team coach who was here for doing, doing a program with Mina. And she chatted with Steve and came up to me afterwards and said, you need to really focus on talking to this athlete and seeing what his intentions are and see what the potential is. Um, so we rode together over the course of that summer and then started submitting times to the national team um, and really quickly realized that the very preliminary times that we were putting in were essentially the best times that had been seen in Canada up until that, to that point. We started rowing uh, on the ergometer and comparing some of my numbers to uh, you know what they were doing on the on the national team, and real, we realized that uh, you know my numbers were quite uh, competitive. So that took us to the Canadian Indoor Rowing Championships, um, which I did very well at, and then from there that uh, we sort of got identified by the national program. From the first set of practices, we knew that we had a potential to get Steve on the national team. And Steve was interested in, in working with the community. And so we had a, a workshop with the ILSM, the Independent Living Suburban Manitoulin, within weeks of Steve starting. And he's out there with the athletes, working with these recreational athletes, making sure people are comfortable on the erg, you know, giving them enthusiasm, while he's trying to figure out whether he's going to be competing for a spot on the national team. Right? And, and that kind of balance is, is pretty unheard of. So yeah, there was a, a lot of support uh, at that time. I was, you know, fresh off my injury. There was a lot of awareness about, uh, you know, veterans and uh, especially injured veterans. Uh, the Soldier On program was uh, was taking off. Obviously, there was a lot of casualties uh, in Afghanistan. So, the the community, uh, you know, Sudbury and Outline Air really, really uh, stepped up uh, and uh, really helped out with our with our cause. The the boat, obviously, you know, is very expensive. The uh, the rigger and the oars for the boat are are very expensive. And traveling to these camps were were, were quite uh, quite expensive. So. Uh, with the help of the community, we were able to get to the, the training camp, which took place in, in London, Ontario. And we were able to do really well at the, the, the Paralympic trials. And obviously, uh, you know, I, I was able to, to win that and uh, secure a spot on the, on the Paralympic team. When I arrived in, uh, in Beijing in 2008, it was, a, it was pretty much a mind-blowing experience. Right from, from the get-go, the community support, just all the media stuff we did before getting there. Just the scale of everything when we got to, to Beijing, it was just this massive venue, the athlete village, these over-the-top uh, arenas, and, uh, and, and the rowing venue was just uh, spectacular. After the 2008 Paralympic Games in Beijing, Steve would take a break from the sport and go on to obtain a medical degree from the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. He's now a practicing family physician in Chelmsford, Ontario, which was part of the greater city of Sudbury District Amalgamation in 2001. Recently, Steve has come out of retirement to compete in the 2015 Parapan American Games and the 2017 Invictus Games in Toronto, Ontario. He's a, a unique individual. Um, his ability to go from never being in a boat to the national team in this incredibly short period of time was phenomenal. His ability to do that while he's talking to people in the community and just genuinely being an amazing ambassador for the new program, for parasport, for accessibility, unheard of. Uh, and it was really that combination of timing and enthusiasm uh, that allowed us to, to bring in more people and get more people out of the water. Our community will return after the break. We now return to our community. My name is Nicole Yancey. I am an associate professor in the School of the Environment at Laurentian University. And I am an athlete in the parasport program here at the Northern Water Sports Center. Thomas and I didn't know each other really then, but he just came up to me, as Thomas is known to do, and he said, hey, have you thought about the, the adopted rowing program? I'm not sure it's for me because I had the understanding, or misunderstanding, and I think a lot of people do, that it's not for everybody with disabilities. It might, it's only for, say, people that there's not a whole lot of change in their health, and people who, you know, like if you look at the 
Paralympics. There are certain body types that are shown in that type of programming. And so I thought, I don't think this is for me. But he convinced me. And so I came out the first practice. And I, I, it was hard, for sure. But I just, I love being on the water. When I was a child, I was on the water a lot. So it's not a matter of pretending that there aren't differences. It's a matter of just embracing the fact that we're all different and, and the differences are no different, you know, it, as much as that makes sense. And, yeah. and just rolling with it and, and, you know, doing what we can and, and not making a big deal out of things. Part of the deal with, with having this program is giving the athletes that opportunity to be out there in a situation that's a little bit dangerous, right? We, we've done our due diligence. We're not being reckless. We've thought this through. While we're on the water, the conditions change a little bit. That's exciting, right? That's a lot of fun. There was absolutely nothing about being a disability that should mean you can't have that experience. Right? The best part about Anything. I was going to say the best part of being young, the best part of just being is every now and then, you know, you get a curveball. And you're like, well, what are we going to do with a curveball? We have to guarantee with these kind of sport programs is we give everybody that opportunity, that opportunity to go out, have a good time, get exhausted, you know, do your sport. Corey Albert has been rowing with the Parasport program for over seven years. He takes us through what the new building has meant to him and other athletes in the program. When I went in my Chargers, Unsexable uh, access to curbs, bus stops. We're, we're excited to get a new building because it's more accessible for us to get more athletes and more coaches to help out. Every single one of them are good for us. We just row, have fun, and get people out and have some help and support. We shouldn't say, you've got a disability, we're cutting risk out, right? We're going to think about it, we're going to do things in an intelligible fashion, but I think the best part of the, the practice this morning was we went out there and we put him in sort of a risky situation and we got out of it and we did a really nice job and gave him that experience. How important is that? With volunteers from across the city, the success of the program relies heavily on coaching and the support from across the community. My name's Emily. I work in Sudbury with uh, the March of Dimes program. Um, and I work with veterans specifically, but I've been involved in this program with Thomas mainly uh, for about seven or eight years. And it's interesting now that my job is affiliated with March of Dimes, we're working with one athlete who also is a a program participant of March of Dimes. Um, so it's been interesting to watch the athletes progress through the time. But my interest in staying with the program is uh, the athletes are totally unique. And they, I think, appreciate this programming more than most people do. They come in mostly from outside of Sudbury. They take the bus, they get rides, they do whatever they can. And they always appreciate what we're doing on the water. I got involved because I was coaching other programs and I saw a need for volunteers, but I also really appreciate how much you can change someone's life. And rowing has completely changed my life, and I'm fortunate to be able-bodied, so I don't have the same challenges they do. But it's been really fulfilling, and I've learned a lot about myself and how I communicate with others and how I can be more supportive to others through coaching with the program. And you learn a lot about yourself and about other people, so that's been really special. Rowing is not a common thing, and it's certainly not common for adaptive athletes, but we have a really good time. We go out for coffee after, we hang out, we support each other. Everyone is here for everyone else, and it's a very special community of people who will support you at all costs. So if it's a ride, we can help with that. If it's cost, we can help with that. There is no barrier that we can't overcome, and so I would, I would say come out, let us know. We'd love to have you. It all comes down to just, you know, a series of really fortunate events that, that sort of fell into place. And you start, you know, doing the timeline. And many of us that were part of that project have joked about the number of times that this project almost didn't happen. And I do not know the number of nights that I lay awake, real, you know, thinking, okay, I don't, we're, we're a million dollars short. I don't know we're gonna, where we're going to get a million dollars. I, I don't know the number of times that that happened. And that was after we felt like, you know, the end was in sight. It was feeding on the energy of Diana, Bob, and Sheila, so that when one of us was really struggling with the idea that, you know, we had put so many years into this and we still weren't gonna make it happen, 
and somebody would step up and say, you know, we, we can make this happen. There's somebody I can talk to, we can find an access to another route of funding, or we can find another way to economize within the way that we're approaching the, the, the project. Um, there's some really neat stories about ways that we took a really expensive project and scaled it to a manageable project that when you walk around does not look like it was done on a budget. Right? And it was very much done on a budget. It was a challenging economic time. How are we going to make a huge project work on a not as huge budget? And once we've got the athlete, we've got a boat, we've got some coaching, then we can go to the community and say, okay, we need a lot of help to make this happen. And that was a lot of the work with Nancy Recolet. My name is Bobby Joe Maltes, and my mom's name was Nancy Recolette. Um, she was the go-between funding and the program itself. So she was the person that helped Dr. Thomas Merritt get the paperwork together for the funding and, and to start the program itself. My mom was a strong advocate for the little person, whether it be um, Native people losing their status or people with disabilities or Native women. Um, disabilities played a big part for her because she was deaf. She did wear hearing aids, so she was um, hearing impaired. Um, she just had a big heart. She was a worker bee, but the family value was definitely within her since she was a kid. Um, she grew up on Whitefish River First Nation, so she grew up with strong Native values, the seven grandfather teachings. So these, like, they, they did, they, mold, they molded her. The Ojibwe First Nations people carry a strong following in Northern Ontario. The region is home to thousands of residents who actively promote traditional values across the community. The original stories of the seven grandfather or grandmother teachings are present in almost all Ojibwe First Nations communities. Each have embraced the teachings to suit their community values and they identify the same concepts of abiding by a moral respect for all living things. I'm not sure how an elder chooses a name um, but they, they do a lot of fasting and praying about it. Uh, they ask for um, guidance. Would I say she talked to my mom about it? I don't know. Um, so she came back and she called me and she said, I got your mom's name. It's Oda Makwe. She says it means strawberry woman. And the way she explained it to me was strawberries, they have roots, shoots, the berries themselves, and they have runners that reach out to make more plants, um, to make a patch, essentially, of wild strawberries. And she said, that was your mom. Because with the runners reaching out to make more little strawberries, because that's what they do, they make more little strawberries and make more plants, she said, that was your mom. She was a communi community builder. So one of our goals with the Water Sports Center is just help Sudbury be a more active community. Right? And so what does that look like? Honestly, the first thing that that looks like is more people out and active on the water. We've got a really active, vibrant uh, program going, and we are sharing the docks with 100 to 200 dragon boaters, and I don't know how many dozen canoes, kayaks, windsurfers, stand-up ports. The success of the center looks like that just absolute circus of people out there and active, and really just, you know, getting out. We, we live in a beautiful part of the world, and one of the things that the Water Sports Center can do is make sure that everybody has access to being active and just enjoying that beautiful part of the world. I've always been a firm believer that, you know, sport um, is important to, uh, to human development. You know, you see uh, kids who are in sport from a young age really thrive in life. When you have a catastrophic uh, injury and, and you're disabled, it's often very easy to become, uh, you know, reclusive and, and shy away from, from society. Uh, sport is a way of, of, of getting back out there. I think, you know, the peer aspect of it is huge. I think just getting out there and getting physically active and, you know, the physiologic uh, release of endorphins, the feel-good hormones uh, have, have something to do with it. And, and obviously the, 
the sense of community. Dedicated to Nancy Recollet. Produced, directed, and written by Jay Baxter Darrow. Camera operators Ryan Mariotti, Paul W. Loss. Editors Alex Booth, Manuel Grado Andrade. Integrated descriptive video specialist Emily Hardy. Narrator Jim Van Horn. Sound mixer Patton Rodriguez. Production supervisor Janice Civitilli. Director production Karen I. Director programming Brian Perdue. Vice President Programming and Production John Melville. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2018 Accessible Media Inc.